This is Liberty Law Talk, part of Liberty Fund's online library of law and liberty. Your host is Liberty Fund fellow Richard Reinch. Our web address is libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org. Today we are discussing with Dr. Greg Weiner his new book, American Burke, The Uncommon Liberalism of Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Greg Weiner is Assistant Professor of Political Science at Assumption College. He is the author of Madison's Metronome, and he is a frequent contributor to the Library of Law and Liberty. Greg, glad to have you on the program. Thank you for having me. So the title of your book, American Burke, The Uncommon Liberalism of Daniel Patrick Moynihan. What makes Daniel Patrick Moynihan the American Burke? Well, a, a couple of things. One is he stands at that very venerable tradi- uh, intersection of statesmanship and scholarship that, that uh, a, a practicing statesman who was interested in, the, in a, a life of the mind and in the, the world of enduring ideas. I, I think more importantly, importantly, rather, what makes him a Burkean is his, his uh, abiding belief in limits, uh, in limitation as a principle of, of politics. Uh, and there are other principles as well. Subsidiarity is is one. His uh, Moynihan loved to quote Burke on the little platoons as the organizing principles of society. And Moynihan was a great believer in the family as the basic socializing unit of of uh, society. But I, I think the, the I think the key principle and what's been lost in uh, on Moynihan's side of the political aisle is the principle of of limitation, which I think is one of the points I want to make in the book is available to both sides of the aisle, or at least used to be, but has been, uh, I think, lost uh, largely. I, and I think arguably lost on, on um, at least in certain quarters on both sides. On, uh, on this point, um, and maybe a way to understanding uh, what you mean by American Burke, I mean, we're, we're talking about Daniel Patrick Moynihan. I want you to kind of sketch his career for us in a minute. A uh, lifelong member of the Democratic Party, uh, served in the United States Senate as a Democrat, worked in the Johnson administration, um, advocate, believed very much in the policies of the New Deal, criticized the Great Society, as you note, um, worked in the Nixon administration, but on, uh, on the idea, working for the idea of a guaranteed income, uh, which didn't come to pass. Many would say it sounds strange that he would be uh, the American Burke, uh, given a lot of things. Now, you, 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 I know you will get into why you think that is the case in more, more detail, but I think maybe one key is a poem that you uh, you quote um, that you cite because it was one of uh, Moynihan's favorite poems from from Yeats. Uh, the poem is Parnell, and and the the, the section of the poem, uh, Parnell came down the road. He said to a cheering man, "Ireland shall get her freedom, and you still break stone." And on his, Moynihan's gloss on this was, "This is the knowledge life gives us." and it is indispensable to politics, and yet how alien to it. Yeah, it's a, he called it the most important political poem of the 20th century, and I think it is fundamentally about the limits of what politics can achieve. So Parnell is that, that revolutionary Irish uh, leader who is saying to the cheering man, uh, we can achieve everything you want politically, and you're still going to be a stonebreaker. Right? It's not going to transform your your uh, uh, your life. And I think uh, Moynihan. In a, uh, th- th- there are a couple senses in which that's relevant. One is that um, Moynihan was really touched, I think, by a sense of the tragic in politics. He was. Um, it's a little unclear whether he was a student of it, but at a minimum was a, was exposed to Oakshot at the London School of Economics in the when he was a student there. And really has that sense that, that that sense about him. Uh, the other, I think, again, is that sense of limitation of what politics is capable of achieving. I think it's capable. And I, th- this is the, the the key distinction I think between New Deal liberalism and Great Society liberalism is the difference between ameliorating uh, social ills and transforming social ills. And he believed the former was capable and the latter was not. Uh, and I, I think that's what comes across in that uh, in that poem. There's a there's a wonderful passage in his. Uh, he, there's a long introduction to his book Coping, which is uh, which is in itself a wonderful and revealing title. Uh, it's, uh, the subtitle is on Essays on the Art of Government, um, in in which he reimagines Kennedy's inaugural, yeah. and uh, he says that that. Uh, 
suppose that Kennedy had said we would be crazy to bear any price, uh, to pay any price, bear any burden, uh, uh, support any friend, oppose any foe, and so on and so forth. And he, he says there would have been nothing inspiring in this. There might also have been no Vietnam. Yeah. Right? So the, the, there's this there's this dual sense at the heart of politics that it demands these heart quickening um, moments. Yet there there's also that Burkean sense that they can get carried away. Yeah. No. I I want to. Uh you know, just sort of touch on Burke's influence and how you trace that influence. Uh, I mean, having spent so much time and Daniel Patrick Moynihan wrote 19 books um, at George Well joked. I think you said that's more than most senators have read uh, right. that, that there's probably something to that. Um, <laughs> but uh, th- this is a man who wrote and thought deeply uh, uh, about politics on uh, and thinking about the subtitle you've got uncommon liberalism. Um, uh, I guess it, it could be that we're just so weary now. Uh, we're just so tired. We have seen government, the federal government, fail so much and so often uh, that we struggle, or at least I struggle when I hear you or, or when I read Moynihan say uh, the, uh, how why we can be skeptical of the, and, and be aware and need to be aware of the limits of government, but what it can actually do, what we can actually do with it in common can still be good. And we might know that in particular ways. Uh, it seems to me one of his markers here is social science and the evidence of social science to maybe chart a way forward. Uh, but I'm thinking about uncommon liberalism in the introduction, um, which is called, and you still break stone. Uh, he responds to Jimmy Carter's famous uh, crisis of confidence address um, uh, which is you know well known, uh, well known in folklore and, uh, amongst particularly Reaganite conservatives as being kind of maybe the beginning of the end of Mr. Carter. And how how does Daniel Patrick Moynihan respond? He responds uh, by saying that the president is right to speak to us of a crisis in morale in our society, and we owe him our gratitude for putting the subject at the center of our public discourse. But, he says, uh, he says, there are two traditions and outlooks which intermingle under the broad canopy of liberalism. One of these is called the pluralist position held by Edmund Burke, that the nature of man is intricate, the objects of society are the greatest possible complexity, and no simple disposition or direction of power can be suitable either to man's nature or to the quality of his affairs. And that's why, as he goes on to say, we have to have the, the small platoons, quoting Burke here, church, family club, trade union commercial association, uh, things like that, that separate man between, between man and the state. Um, but on, on, on the score, I mean, I wonder, does, does Moynihan seem to fail to realize that modern liberalism, uh, particularly the kind that, that, in, that inspires his own great society, seems not really to admit of limits within its own ideology, within its own understanding of government? Was that what he was always bucking up against? I think there's certainly an inherent tension that he's um, that he's bucking up against. Uh, what I would recur to, I think, is that tension between amelioration and transformation. Um, if one focuses on amelioration, then one can argue about the degree of, of uh, charity and the degree of generosity, but is not involved in in the, the sort of utopian project against which Burke would would warn. I, I, I think we tend to forget, by the way, that Burke was was uh, to no small degree a reformer in his own uh, in his own right. Uh, so. Um, you know, Burke Burke is is what I would call a conserving reformer, and I think there's there's much of that in um, in Moynihan. I, I don't think there's anything about amelioration that is inherently hostile to those subsidiary units that Moynihan is is talking about in the to the to the pluralism that Moynihan is talking about in that passage. So you're saying when you're saying we're talking about common liberalism, um, uh, uncommon liberalism here. Uh, maybe more if we if we think about the kind of dominant metaphors within within modern political culture we've got we've got uh, the evolution uh, of power so it it all it's out of pre exists and it's just all sort of rolling out in front of us uh, we've got progress uh, pick the right road uh, and stay on it even if it's the wrong road uh, but he's somewhere else he's somewhere else there's a form there's a good. Uh, and there's judgment uh, and, and deliberation, et cetera. These are the qualities 
that make for uh, Republican politics. I think that's I, I think that's certainly right. I, I definitely avoid the word progressive in talking about his liberalism because I, I don't see the inherent faith, in, a sort of Hegelian faith in the progress of uh, yeah. of history or the the sense that that what is new is inherently um, uh, getting better or, or is is. Um, is is tending to get better. This this framework between amelioration and um, transformation is is familiar, by the way, also to Ted Lowy in in um, uh, in the end of liberalism uh, when he he talks about that distinction between the New Deal and the Great Society uh, as well, because it, it it really has a profound impact on the nature of uh, of liberalism and in, in a government in the United States, I, and I, I think it's it's really underappreciated. So those those tensions that you're talking about, I, I think, are much more latent in the Great Society variant than in the New Deal, uh, in the New Deal variant. And when we talk about the failures of government, you know, Moynihan would talk about uh, Social Security as the great success of government, and one of the great one of the secrets to its success is its enormous simplicity. Right? Elderly people are the the poorest segment of the population. Why are they Why are they poor? Because they don't have money. So the, what's the answer? The answer is give them money. Yeah. Right. Give the money and it works. Yeah. Right. So, so the the poorest uh, segment of the population becomes, comparatively speaking, one of the uh, one of the wealthiest. Right. So it's a it's a it's a great success, but it's a great success because of because of its simplicity. It's not an attempt to micromanage anybody's lives. It's not an uh, it's not an attempt to to rewrite uh, the power structures in society as the uh, as the uh, as the great societies. Um, uh, programs became. It's simply an attempt to to uh, give give people who needed money money. And what, one of his uh, he he says it. Um, I forget exactly when, but at one point in the 1980s, that well, well, he's a fierce critic of um, President Reagan on a lot of welfare policies. He says the one thing he appreciates about the Republican Party is the clarity with which they understand poverty as a condition of not having enough money. Yeah, as opposed to. What what you write about uh, Moynihan seeing the Great Society, the attempt to transform human nature through a series of managers, uh, programs, uh, experts, incentives, all this sorts of business, getting inside neighborhoods, messing with whatever ecology is there, uh, in the service of some sort of preconceived egalitarian end. Is that is that, is that the crucial distinction here? I, I think that's yeah. a crucial distinction. Distinction, and, and there was an explicit goal of changing the power structures. So the idea is that the, the, one of the ideas of the community, uh, some of the community programs in the war on poverty, was, was that that there was inadequate power in the neighborhoods. Right? And one of him, one hands, I think, beautiful insights is that for the for the first several years of the war on poverty, poor people are being taxed and their income transferred. To middle class providers who are ministering to them, so that the 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 income transfer effect of the war on poverty is in fact upward. The the income redistribution effect is upward. Right, so there, there's a there was a wonderful episode when Moynihan was working for the Nixon administration. He was walking across the Harvard campus, and a, a group of um, of uh, students stopped him and started harassing him about uh, about cuts in social services. And he said, "You're defending a class interest." Because right, these were a group of future teachers and social workers and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, no, the, I mean, this, this we could go a lot of ways. I mean, that's, that's an interesting um, uh, sight there. On, you know, thinking about his, um, uh, say, the combination of social and political thought, uh, we mentioned pluralism, and we say the family is the fundamental unit uh, for Moynihan, yeah. and a lot of this derives from... Uh, uh, Catholic social thought, and you, you've got the citations there where you could see him you know, wrestling with social encyclicals uh, from the church during the 20th century and as they came down one after another, trying to address the uh, uniquely revealed problems of modern democratic capitalistic societies. But so what's not it for Moynihan is the autonomous individual uh, who, is, who is without family, without neighborhood, uh, without sort of obligations, relational obligations that will uh, define him and that will shape him or her, uh, and, and that he in a way has a gratitude for. I mean, I think this is, this is key for Moynihan. Uh, you argue uh, he seems to have lost that, uh, and, and it seems in, uh, to the extent we even have politicians speaking that way now, uh, it's on the Republican side, but it's not... It's certainly not in the same vein of of thinking of the, what, what are the ways in which government uh, policies could actually support uh, the family and and support it uh, support a 
traditional family uh, doing things uh, independently of the state uh, with, with some sort of assistance, some sort of incentive mechanisms to maintain it um, in the face of various forms of opposition that might come about. I mean, that we really, that's really not being done today. The only group I can think of would be uh, this new kind of newfangled group, the Reform Conservatives. Um, how did Moynihan, though, see going forward a sexual revolution 60s, 70s, and 80s, where it's just more and more the case that marriage is becoming kind of an option, and not something that adults necessarily are, are grown and raised to do. He was profoundly concerned about it. He described it at, at, at one point. He said, we may even be talking about speciation uh, with respect to uh, uh, to the collapse of marriage. Um, w- the way that Moynihan talked about this was the need for a family policy, which was an idea he, he borrowed from, from uh, Alva Myrdal, an, an insight that, that she came to, which, which was the idea that Nations have policies that affect families, and I think this is a this is this is key. This this actually is an insight that I think touches on his foreign policy, as well. That the idea is not that you set out to transform the pol- the, the family. Uh, it's not even the idea that you set out to to rescue the family. The idea is in the ordinary course of government business, you do things that touch the family, yeah. uh, un- unavoidably, and you ought to do that in a thoughtful and coherent way. Right. So, so, that, so for example, at the end of uh, the report on the African American family, he simply says we should declare. He doesn't. He doesn't pres- prescribe the specifics. He simply says we should declare a policy that the goal of the the federal government is is to strengthen the African American family. And he says uh, he, he says at one point that that simply declaring that goal will 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 force the federal government to report to Congress on it, to to uh, to coordinate its efforts on it, and and to be. Uh, I think simply being conscious of it, being conscious of the fact that, that things like the marriage penalty and so on and so forth affect families uh, in ways that that, um, that the government may not be, um, uh, in, in Congress may not entirely take note of. So, I mean, we, we see uh, in the Moynihan Report, which you just referenced, the famous Moynihan Report yeah. um, that came out 50 years ago uh, this year. Uh, what's, what's the argument here? I mean, this is a crucial moment in his career. Uh, he's widely criticized, I think, for political reasons, not not for people actually trying to wrestle with the report and understand its arguments and terms. He's criticized as a racist. He's criticized as someone piling on to the woes of blacks in America, not understanding racism that's beset them. All of these, all this, this business is kind of thrown at what he did, uh, and yet. This goes back to the family policy that we're talking about. I think it's it's a it's a crucial recognition of of marital breakdown. Uh, Moynihan's clear uh, about what he thinks the causes are. It's it's not something endemic to blacks. It's not a racist claim at all. Uh, and yet he's vilified for it. What what do you think he took from that experience? Well, he was immensely courageous. He never backed down from it. Um, I, I think he certainly took from it. Um, that it that that um, you know one of the things he he talked about is that it froze the state of research on the topic for a generation the 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 reaction to it yeah. uh, but but he never he never backed off of the um, uh, of the topic and I, I think one of the things that that um, uh, I'm not sure I'm directly answering your question, but one of one of the things that is so impressive about that report is is the, is the method of it, the manner in which he he connects generalizations together in a way that that is no longer permitted to either scholars or um, or statesmen. So you you mentioned the the vilification. What he clearly says in the report is that the legacy of of slavery and of Reconstruction and of poverty causes family breakdown. The interpretation is that it's the other way around. The, the, the um, uh, uh, Wilson, William Julius Wilson says that, that, that a lot of the misunderstanding comes from from the press simply taking excerpts or conclusions and mm-hmm. not and, and not the the setup. So even in on the 50th anniversary, even a lot of the the, the um, analysis and the commemorations get this simply backwards. So, so say that he's saying that that. Uh, that um, family breakdown leads to poverty. When he when he he very clearly says it's the other, yeah. um, it's the other way around. Yeah, you know, Jason Riley of the Wall Street Journal seemed to say that, and and some of his writings. I mean, he has a new book out on uh, on on the ways in which the federal government has actually hurt African Americans 
Uh, and, you know, he mentions this, and, and he seems to be saying exactly that, which is interesting. Um, the Moynihan was in the Moynihan report also interesting, you note, um, and, and this will come, this will become live again in the 90s in the welfare reform debates, uh, because as, as you just alluded to, it wasn't the case that, that the decline of the black family had led to poverty. The analysis is that the, the, um, the legacy of slavery and of Reconstruction and and the poverty that Absolutely. results from that leads leads to the decline of the, and, the family. Yeah, I'm sorry. There, there, there's no question that the that the decline of the family reinforces that that, yes. that cycle. So that's why when he's saying that uh, the welfare state didn't cause right the, 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 that that's, he felt that's his reply quite, to Charles Murray Trump. and others in the 90s. I mean that's that's right. And his yeah. in his his case for that is that he spots this in the data before the first shot in the war on poverty is is fired, and that if you look at the trends across the Atlantic world, the breakdown of the family is occurring regardless of the of the uh, welfare policy. So the, this seems to be a uniform cultural shift that's happening across uh, Atlantic democracies. On uh, on the war on poverty and on this point uh, in general. Uh, so I mean, but this. Uh, obviously, both things can be true, though. Sure. Um, I mean, I guess it, it does seem interesting to me that even in the 90s, he would have held that position uh, that AFDC was not causing uh, family breakdown, uh, that it was not inducing it or making it worse or anything like that. That seems, I mean, that just seems kind of bizarre to me when we look at, I mean, the rates of, I mean, now 75% of children uh, and black families are born outside of marriage. This is true uh, for lower, you know, for uh, poor whites, uh, Hispanics, etc. It seems, in a certain way, it has to be the case that the government is replacing the family at a basic level. Well, he certainly understood that that there were specific uh, structural issues in AFTC, such as the the, the fa- he, he once called it a fa- he once said we do have a family policy. It's just for broken families. Right? So the family had to break up before it became yeah, eligible for yeah. for AFTC. So so he certainly understood there were there were. Um, Elements of it that, that that contributed to family breakup. I think what what he what he denied. Uh, and by the way, it was his welfare reform in 1988, which passed um, uh, either unanimously or nearly unanimously, that touches off this this wave of state um, experimentation on this on this uh, topic and the, that um, uh, attempts to put in place some tough uh, child support enforcement and, and uh, so on and so forth. What he wants to deny is that a basic um, entitlement model based on on the needs of children is is a, a causal mechanism for the for the breakdown of, of families, and and I think there, there's you know there, there's also the the um, I suppose one would say the moral question of what what's the first what's the first priority, and I think he would say the first priority is is feeding hungry children. On uh, this question, he was in favor of a guaranteed income. Yes. Uh, and, and you write about that at length. Uh, but yet he determines that that seems to be leading to family dissolution, and he backs away from it. Is that right? He backed away from it. There was, there was a series of experiments, uh, controlled experiments in Seattle and Denver, and there was, there was the initial statistical analysis suggested that it, led to, that it increased family dissolution. Increased family dissolution, and so at, at this point, he's he's looking at AFDC. Uh, you know, if we think about the momentum that building that builds for reform of that, uh, yeah. and but he so he's just going to stick to that. that. That's what he does. He, uh, does he propose reforms to it without? I mean, I guess going all the way with block granting it to the states, as was ultimately done at a time limit. Yeah, I, I mean, his bottom line is he wants a, a a guarantee that the federal government is going to support dependent children based on the number uh, based on need. Right? Okay. So, so the the pro, there, there are two problems with the with the reform in '96 for him. One is is the the five year limitation, right? The five year lifetime limitation. Uh, and, and the second is the block grant, the, the fact that the block grant doesn't address the number of children in need. It doesn't vary based on, the, the amount of the block grant doesn't vary based on the, the, the number of children in need. So in, in other words, it's no longer a federal guarantee of support uh, for children in need. Beyond that, I think he's absolutely all for uh, the experimentation in different kinds of welfare policy. So there, there, there's certainly no, he, he's, he's absolutely not locked into the, what I would describe as the AFDC model. 
and he's he's all for experimentation within that. He just wants an underlying okay. federal guarantee. Right. And one of the reasons, by the way, for the underlying federal guarantee is so that you don't have a race to the to the bottom of states uh, uh, trying to underbid one another, so as not to attract welfare beneficiaries. Okay. I uh, interesting. I mean, I, I, I think he may be slightly switching gears here. So if we talk about his. Um, not not a not not a faith in government, but a belief that government has to act in democratic society. We talked about social security um, alleviating poverty in the elderly population, but what are the things he thought that the government had actually the federal government had actually gotten right in the twentieth century? Um, and maybe that's too big. You know, the second half of the twentieth century. I don't know. I mean, we said we say the New Deal, uh, but that of course encompasses a lot of programs and policies. But um, I, I'm just curious because I keep thinking. What's the legacy today of the federal government, and what's the legacy of its uh, of the bureaucracy of the rules uh, that it implements, uh, and seemingly you know things that you know just are that we discuss all the time. I mean, it's almost like uh, you know just the back of the thumb calculation. The federal government is going to mess it up, and most people, yeah. when they're polled, think the government gets it wrong. So I, I guess I wonder uh, with with Moynihan, what sort of caution does he give us in being overly skeptical of the federal government? Well, I, I think it's important to understand, in, in order to understand Moynihan, that he is basically a New Deal liberal. Right? So, so he, he's basically a New Deal liberal whose liberalism is framed by limitation. So I don't want to overstate the skepticism of, of, uh, mm-hmm. of government. Um, I, I think, so I think he, his, uh, you know, he's a he's a Keynesian would be another way of 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 uh, of putting it. Um, I, I'm not sure he would have said this toward the end of his life, but at one point he he sort of felt that Keynesian economics had perhaps shown a way toward conquering the business cycle, for example. So I, I think that's that would be an example of sort of the maybe the the outside stretches of the New Deal uh-huh. of the New Deal liberalism. But in terms of what he would say government had gotten right, I mean, he led a, uh, a major reform of transportation policy, of, of um, intermodal transportation policy and during his years in the Senate. Um, I, I think he would say, um, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm weaving strands together, so I'm not quoting him here. But Why, I think why he, would that matter so much for him, though, that sort of urban, why would, would, urban mass transportation? I said oh, because of it, funding that in various cities, things like that. Yeah, because of, because of community, because he thought the highway system had destroyed the okay. interstate system as, as originally conceived had destroyed neighborhoods. Okay, right? It, it bisected neighborhoods and and um, destroyed. It, 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 I think that was an issue of subsidiarity for him. Okay. Um, okay. So I. I um, I, you know, I, I, I think he would say, right, the, the, the Cold War is an example of, the, of government getting something, okay. uh, yeah. getting something right. Um, I, I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to mix um, my own views with with exegesis of Moynihan here, but I, sure. I, I think it may be useful to detach the ameliorative from the administrative elements of the New Deal, that there may be a, there may be a more valuable legacy of the former than the latter, okay. and I'm not sure that one depends on the, one depends on the other. I, I suspect Moynihan was probably fairly, fairly tolerant of, of both, and in the Keynesian mold would, would probably credit both of those with, with having overcome the depression would, would be my would be my guess now I, I, there's not a lot of writings that i recall specifically in political economy but that would be my that would be my guess I mean, i'm curious hearing you say this i mean how how did he respond to we'll say the conservative movements really more full-throated domestic policy reforms of the 1990s uh i'm thinking about school choice reform um uh i think about the idea of uh, tax cuts, uh, you know, really aggressive tax cutting, um, uh, in particular, and 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 efforts to, you know, in effect, shift more power. We could argue this is misguided. Shift more power in the form of block grants on a range of programs to states, and for the federal government just to become, uh, really, just a more of a general governing body. Although none of this, none of this has really happened, uh, at least at the federal level. Right. But I, I'm curious, how did he see? You know these these sorts of more advanced proposals that were in many respects, I think, a pretty honest response to just the failures of big government. 
Right. I, I think he had some concerns about them. I, I think he he wrote a an op ed, if I recall correctly, for the New York Times called the Devolution Revolution, in which he he outlined some concerns that um, I'm going from memory here, but that that sort of pertain to the fact that block grants seem to address um, seem to be ways of undermining um, programs to which they're adherents were otherwise, uh, the block grants adherents were otherwise opposed, so that they seem to be simple ways of, uh, of undercutting uh, programs to which one hand wanted to see federal commitments maintained. So I, I don't think he, I mean, he, he certainly, again, in the liberal mode was not bashful about, about uh, or, or apologetic in any way about national, um, national commitments. Um, so the, the, the block granting concerned him. Now, I, I, the, in terms of the tax cutting, I can answer that with a little bit more clarity in the 1980s, which is that he saw the Reagan tax cuts as uh, an assault on the concept of government itself, really. Um, he, uh, Stockman, by the way, was a student of his at, at uh, Harvard, and um, uh, he knew him uh, fairly well, and um, saw the uh, early on, um, before the sort of start of the beast strategy became uh, public, saw that, saw that that was what was going on, but saw it as a uh, um, sort of starving revenue, but, but uh, borrowing to continue to feed the beast. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's so. really the consensus in American politics. Right. Uh, uh, right. Yeah. No. I. It's interesting you mentioned Reagan. I mean, that kind of gets into maybe the you know, foreign policy, Moynihan, which you write about. Uh, sure. uh, interesting uh, on the Soviet Union. It's 1979. Uh, he sees this as a decrepit country, has a yeah. dying nation, and he slowly uh, comes around to the position that it's not a threat. It's not an existential threat anymore. Um, right. And for this reason, I mean, I, just, I was unaware of this entirely. Uh, largely opposes Reagan's military spending and his military, I guess his, his military posturing in general, uh, because of this. Uh, t- you know, talk about that. Did anyone? What did people make of that? Uh, him saying this was a dying country. I mean, what I've always read is, you know, people thought at the end of the '70s, Soviet Union was really at the was really a, an aggressive empire and was really pushing uh, the limits to see what how we would respond. And uh, you know, here's Moynihan, as, as you point, saying. Uh, they're they're dying. Yeah, there there are two things I would say about that. One is he described it as he was sending out a signal on a frequency that no one was was capable of picking up. Uh, that it wasn't that the the um, it wasn't that his view was rejected. It was simply that it couldn't be it couldn't be heard. Uh, he at, at one point in the um, being because who, there are two opposing camps. There's a there's a conservative hawk and then a a liberal dovish camp, That's right. both of which are talking past each other largely. That's right. And, he, he, yeah, okay. it, yeah, at one point in the arms control negotiations in Geneva, he was it must have been there as an observer, and he asked one of the one of the uh, American negotiators, "What makes you think there's going to be a Soviet Union to um, uh, to implement this agreement with?" And and he he said he just got no response. He got a blank stare. Um, <laughs> that, would have, that would have been in the early 1980s. Um, the, but the second, the second reaction was a sense that Moynihan had betrayed his earlier views, because in the late 1970s, Moynihan had been a Scoop Jackson uh, Democrat, and had been quite a, a went, you know, when Carter said that the real axis was not east and west, but north and south, yeah. and uh, he'd been he'd been quite a fierce critic of that, and, and I think may continue to be a fierce critic of that. And by by the way, uh, was a critic of even of the Reagan administration's grain loans to the um, Soviet Union. Said that we were we were helping them to carry out Lenin's uh, Lenin's predictions that the West would would provide the rope with which uh, uh, they would hang us. Um, but but I, I think this is this is a situ- this is a case in which. Um, you know, he liked to uh, quote uh, Polanyi that, that uh, sometimes people change their minds. And what happened is in the late 70s, he saw uh, demographic information that showed that life expectancy in the Soviet Union, as he said, against all possibility, was shrinking, uh, which, which simply, as he put it, couldn't happen in the modern world. Um, and uh, he, he saw that and concluded that the, the society was dying. Um, I was recently at a panel discussion on, on Moynihan, and, and somebody said, uh, why didn't 
um, Moynihan help Reagan push the Soviets over the edge? And my response was, he thought they didn't need a push over the edge. They were uh, they were moving toward the edge, and his worry was that what was in the, the 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 policies that were involved in pushing them over the edge were both uh, costing a lot of money and and had constitutional costs in in things like the Iran Contra affair and the mining of the Nicaraguan harbors and and uh, so forth. So he he didn't like what was necessary to push them over the edge, and he didn't think it was he didn't think it was necessary either. Uh, on this question of uh, of Moynihan looking at the Soviet Union and, and, and thinking that it's dying, uh, I mean, it, interesting how there was also another view uh, going on as well, and even a, a basic economic view that this, uh, I mean, I, it's strange to think about this, but the leading economics textbook of, 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 of the period had, yeah. I think it's Paul Samuelson, uh, this is a success story largely is what it's saying, the economics are largely working. Uh, I, I, I find that so... So interesting. Um, Iran Contra, uh, as well, we have a display, Moynihan recognizing executive power, the abuse of executive power, uh, and confronting confronting the Reagan administration over it. Yet, you know, what, what came of that uh, period? Because that's there, there's a crucial moment there of a call. Maybe there's going to be calls for impeachment. That's probably not going to go anywhere. And Moynihan sort of comes up, and he's in a middle compromise position uh, as, uh, there. He is. Um, if I could just back you up one sure. second to tell you a priceless anecdote uh, in his book, Secrecy, um, uh, which is a wonderful book. He says that um, on the Foreign Service exam at the time, one of the questions was, is, is, I'm sure I'm oversimplifying this, but is the East German or the West German economy larger? And based, I assume, on Samuelson's book, the, the correct answer was East German. So he said, if you answered East German, you went into the career in the Foreign Service. If you answered West German, you failed the exam and you went on to a career in investment banking. <laughs> but, <laughs> That's great. Uh, but anyway, the, the, yeah. So so Moynihan, um, right after the Iran Contra uh, revelations became public, delivered the Democratic um, uh, radio ad- response. I guess you would call it a radio address when those were still being done on. Um, uh, that weekend, and it, it, the tone of it is really quite pleading uh, with the president. It's not a partisan attack; uh, it's a plea to save his his presidency. Uh, and and um, you know, Moynihan worked for four successive presidents for for Kennedy, uh, Johnson, Nixon, and then Ford. Had seen one presidency destroyed from within. And while he was a critic, particularly throughout his Senate career, of excessive executive power, understood the need for a strong presidency and didn't want to see it destroyed. By the way, didn't want to see Clinton's uh, destroyed either. Um, So um, he he did end up, I think, playing somewhat of a healing role in that that episode and somewhat, I I guess I would say, of a calming role in both... both, um, uh, in both episodes, he, when when, um, when Joe Lieberman gave a speech on the Senate floor, uh, I'm, I'm going from again from memory here, but but um, after the Clinton revelations, and, and Lieberman was sort of the first senator to um, uh, Democratic senator to uh, to criticize Clinton on the Senate floor, and uh, Bob Kerry, who I was working for at the time, came down and and. Uh, joined him, Moynihan gave a wonderful speech in which he was, if I recall correctly, harshly critical of the president, but he also quoted, let justice be done, though the heavens fall. And um, and the message, though I, I'll, I, I won't get the words right, was, um, um, as he said in, in another context, that that was better poetry than it was statecraft. And that, that, um, that, that, that we might want to stop a step short of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no. Uh, yeah. No, that's well put. Well said. On on the on, sticking on the uh, foreign policy for a second, yeah. more uh, Woodrow Wilson. Was he right? Yes. Uh, you have a chapter there about Wilson teaching. Yeah. Now that, but that in a way that almost seems to work against your, the ideas in your book. The way Wilson understood foreign policy and, and also you know Wilson at Versailles, uh, which is you know truly yeah. incredible in my opinion, and and the push towards self determination. And the insistence on democracy building and all this sort of business. So, t- talk about that for a minute. Yeah, you know, that that's that that was tough. And of course, Wilson, uh, who did not understand Burke, thought he was a Burkean. Um, yes. Like to quote Burke and and um, 
understood, like to quote the reforming side of Burke and didn't understand the conserving side of him. Um, this was a very, very difficult part of Moynihan to sort out. And I think it's a very complicated intellectual relationship because he's um, he's um, critical of, of Wilson in his book Pandemonium, uh, which is on ethnicity and international politics for having uh, as he said, uh, as he says in that book, America let loose the idea of self-determination on the world and, and is going to have to figure out what to make of it. Um, his view of Wilson, the way I would put it, is that his idea of America's role in the world is more juridical than military, if that's a, if that's a, a sensible way to put it, that, that he sees uh, the spread of democracy as a legal aspiration, not as something to be done at the point of a sword. Um, that would, that, that's not satisfying to me, by the way, but that, that seemed to be a distinction that mattered a great deal to, to Moynihan. And so this would go to Moynihan's commitment to international law. Uh, uh, it it, and it does, it, to, yeah. to Burks as well, by the way. Yeah, uh, as opposed to, so this would be another way of thinking why, I mean, this is, this is so, oh, oh, so interesting, uh, because, you know, I, I, before I even picked up your book, I have always thought of Moynihan, at least in a foreign policy sense, as being a neoconservative, and, and that's frequently applied to him. You strenuously argue that's not the case. I do. Um, and, and maybe the best evidence that can be produced is his, his time as the ambassador, the American ambassador to the United Nations. Um, but I, it, it still strikes me, uh, and, and thinking about this Wilson, that one can see how this might come out in certain respects. Um, sure. And, and he was very friendly with, uh, by the way, with Irving Kristol and Norman Podoritz. And uh, I mean, he traveled in those, in those circles. So it's, it's, not, um, it's not an unreasonable association. But even those guys, I mean, at that time, I mean, this, this later post-Cold War push for democracy promotion that being a guiding element of American foreign policy. I, that, I'd, I've never seen that in Irving Kristol's writings. That's very different. That's very uh, different. From, you know, as our friend Dan Mahoney, though, there's first and second wave neoconservatism. Um, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the international law matters, and that's why uh, you know, one would be – one. Uh, this would be actually a way to – to allow for states to be ordered, uh, even in their military use. Uh, and this guides even you, you, some of his speeches in the UN, I think, or his, his ideas in the UN are, are particularly apt here, uh, in arguing for the way in which nations should deal with one another, uh, and, and why consistent, consistent attempts to smear, uh, Western nations are, are undermining any sort of international order, uh, because of what the part, what the nations must think of themselves and what is owed them, uh, from others if they, if they truly think their woes come from exploitation. That's right. He, in his, his article, The United States in Opposition, which is, is, uh, was, I think, under the anniversary, the 40th anniversary was this year, and I think was under noticed, um, does a wonderful job of tracing the intellectual history of that to, uh, to British, uh, to, to uh, the, the British education of all these um, uh, of uh, people from all these developing uh, countries. Um, I, I think one of the key insights that I took from that period of Moynihan's life was the, it was the importance of language as the currency of, of politics. And, and his, um, it, this, was really some, this was really something that, that um, illuminates how disgusted he got with the radical left in the in the late 1960s as well the the what he once called the fantasizing of language uh, in the debasement of words uh, as a as a currency of again of political discourse and that was the emphasis of uh, at least the, the emphasis for me of his speech on the zionism as as racism resolution that, that when he said today we have drained the word racism of of meaning and and uh, the question is what we're going to drain of meaning uh, tomorrow, and he he had absolutely no patience uh, whatsoever for the for the blaming, for the, the scapegoating, uh, and for the, the the lazy use of of language. There's a um, I can't recall whether I quoted in the in the book or not, but Idi Amin gave a ranting, yes, you did, yeah, cr- crazy speech at um, uh, at the uh, UN, and Moynihan then went off. 
to um, gave gave a speech at the AFL CIO, which was a um, as you know a, a staunchly anti-communist organization, in which he condemned Amin. And he came back, and his staff had prepared an apologetic press release that said said some things Amin said were outrageous, and some things garnered wide approval. And Moynihan uh, said, "I let it be known that not one blank blank thing Amin had said had garnered my wide approval." Yes. Well, I mean that's I mean that's interesting because that means Moynihan understood then the idea. Uh, I mean, so, so clearly, words has weapons rather than an right. attempt to describe reality or to right. to articulate meaning and, and purpose. They are in effect a way to annihilate others or ideologically annihilate them, uh, which is. Wait, well, I mean, that's that's kind of the warp and woof of our politics now, I guess. And, 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 and was the, the weapon of the radical left in the in the yeah. late sixties, which is what what he felt so so um, uh, alienated from. So, how do you see? Uh, I mean, coming to an end here, how do you see this uncommon liberalism playing out? I mean, I, as I was thinking about it now, uh, I, I mean, I don't want to ask you something like who carries the mantle or something like that. I think that, but yeah. in a way, who what, not who, but uh, is there any sort of coalition that seems to uh, understand and, and work from sort of the principles that, that Moynihan did? Or is it sort of forever lost between kind of a, a libertarian rhetoric of, of the Repu- many of the Republicans, although they never seem to vote that way? Uh, and then we've got now we've got government is the only thing we all belong to from the Democrats, a uh, memorable uh, phrase from the 2012 Democratic Convention. So I just I, I wonder if in a way, this uncommon liberalism is lost to us. Um, one of the things, uh, really the thing I try to suggest in the closing chapter is that there might be a coalition of Burkeans, uh, which is to say that Burkean conservatives, and I call Moynihan a Burkean liberal, which I think is a uh, is an achievable, coherent concept, although it, it, um, it, it sounds uh, counterintuitive. I think Burkean liberals and Burkean conservatives probably have more in common with each other than either does with the with the more populist bases of their own party, uh, their own parties rather. Uh, I, I think, uh, well, I, it's hard to identify a standard bearer uh, on, but you, frankly, on either side um, yeah. uh, for Burkeans. I think there might be a coalition. There, I do think there's some frustration from the last. Really, we're going on. What are we at? 14 years now of of executive power uh, that's that's unchecked. Um, I think there is. I, I think there's there's you know despite the way we talk about it, there's broad consensus on what I would describe as the ameliorative aspects of the New Deal, not the administrative aspects, but the ameliorative aspects of the New Deal. Mm-hmm. I think there, I think those are those, at least at a minimal level, those are basically unchallenged. Um, I, I think there's a basis for a uh, except for, a, for it's hard to it's hard to fund that now. Uh, hard to find. It's hard to find. I mean, you know, and, and you know, precisely right. The demographics don't favor it anymore. And, sure. And they, you know, you say but, it uh, is I, interesting. I, I, it is interesting just to think about the type of economic growth you need, also, which we don't seem to have. But uh, but I, I get your point. There's, I, I mean, there's no coalition. To, uh, there's no coalition really to do away with social security or anything like that. Right, and I don't mean necessarily the, the old age programs. I mean, I mean some ameliorative role for okay. for government. Sure. That, that, that's okay. all. I, that's, that's all I point. mean there. Yeah. Right. So um, it, it seems to me that there it, it, that there's. Um, I mean, it seems to me that there is somewhere in the American spirit there is uh, in the American soul there is a respect, a Burkean respect for for the past as a as a, a, a mine of wisdom uh, and of uh, a respect for tradition and, um, and, and conservation. So it seems to me if that Burkean coalition could be cultivated, I think there, I, I certainly think there's a coherent ideological base for it, basis for it, I should say. Mm-hmm. Um, the question is whether there's, a, there, I, I think there could be an electoral basis for it, the question is is whether there's um, there's a leadership for it. Yeah, no. Uh, have you thought at all in this respect about uh, or the so-called reform conservatives? That seems to be a natural. 
Uh, yeah, I think uh, Yuval Levin, for example, has yeah. written some very interesting stuff on 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 this on on uh, yeah. on, on Burke and and so forth. Yeah, but uh, but I do think I mean what, you know one of my uh, one of the the interesting things in writing the the book was I I do think it's got to be a broad conversation, um, and I I do think it's got to be matched by by. Um, um, uh, by a Burkean, I, I, I think. How do I put this? I, I think the political conversation would be enriched by a Burkean liberalism that that um, that draws out that ar- those arguments that Moynihan was trying to make. Greg, I think that's a perfect way to end. We've been talking with the author of American Burke: The Uncommon Liberalism of Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Greg Weiner, thank you so much. Thank you very much. This is your host Richard Greinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, and find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org.